So good morning, everyone. Um, I want to get started. I think we have a, a pretty packed agenda today. Um, so I want to get going. Um, I want to welcome you to the March uh, uh, ITB2 Transmark Foundation Community Meeting. Um, and let me jump right in. My name is Diane Keough. And here's the agenda for today. I'm going to do just a, two or three minutes on some foundation updates. Uh, and then we're gonna jump into um, talking about the sessions that are planned um, at, I, at the AMIA um, coming up next week. Um, Jeff Klan will uh, talk about that. And then Jeff will also talk about loyalty cohorts, um, which I think folks will be pretty interested in. And then what we decided to do was, I think most of the people, at least the US-based um, um, folks are not really Last super year, familiar year, about year, some of the basic um, functionality of uh, transparency. Yeah, and if I could ask uh, folks that aren't speaking to mute themselves, that would be terrific. So the first thing I want to um, remind people is that the foundation uh, community meeting or uh, symposium will be in September um, this year. Um, we're planning on having it in person. Um, we're hoping that COVID uh, is is under control and and um, and everyone can enjoy coming to um, to Boston in September. So the date for our, our symposium is September nineteenth and twentieth. Nineteenth um, will be the main session, um, and the twentieth will be workshops. We're going to really focus on some hands on. Um, really hands-on workshops for, um, for I2B2 and then also for Transmart. Uh, we'll probably have our week working groups um, uh, uh, have a, a sessions on that day as well. So pretty neat day. Um, that week, the, the uh, Precision Medicine Conference that Zach Ohani sponsors every year is also taking place as well as the annual REDCap Conference. Now, REDCap has been remote over the past couple of years, so they're very, very excited about um, having an in-person conference this year, and it happens to be in the same week as, as ours. So what I'm telling folks is come come for the whole week, come, you know, come the weekend before or stay the weekend after, because September is just a terrific time to be in Boston. So mark those calendars. We'll be probably putting the agenda together, you know, over the next um, a month or so, so you'll, you'll have a snapshot of, uh, of what we're going to be doing. Um, also, just a, another mention, I mentioned this last month, we are um, well underway with a redesign of the I2B2 um, web client. It, it's going to be in a, uh, a, a new platform that's going to make it a lot easier to, um, to connect with a lot of other systems, um, and it's going to have a, a look and feel that will be more similar to the, the Shrine UI that was just um, developed. So, I, so stay tuned, probably not next month, but the month after, we'll, we'll definitely um, give you a, a preview at one of these uh, community meetings. Um, if you want to, to look at, to, to see the progress of the user interface, um, the new uh, uh, web client, you can join our user interface working group. And here's a link to, to join, um, or you can just email me and I can give you the, um, the, the information as well. Um, and don't forget, we have an ETL working group. Mike Mendez is gonna be focusing on um, uh, genomic data, integrating genomic data. So that's going to be sort of the new topic, I think, for um, for things moving forward. And the ontology group, that, which is now chaired by Michelle Morris, is starting to get a pretty big, uh, pretty big, pick, big group. So a um, lot of activity in that. So if you're interested in those, you can you can join on our website. Um, and we have a both I2B2 and a Transmark um, software release coming out. You know, in the next uh, couple of months. So we'll give you more details about that. So I went through that quickly because I want to make sure that I uh, give you enough time for um, the, the rest of the agenda. So Jeff Klan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Diane. Uh, so I'm going to just briefly talk about what's happening at AMIA. So AMIA, I think most of you know, is our uh, medical informatics uh, conference, uh, medical informatics society, and there's a spring conference that is happening next week. And some of us are going and presenting some things. Uh, so these are the these are the presentations that are going to happen related to I2B2. Uh, so next slide, please. Oh, where can I control it? What does this button do? You can't. Sometimes no. I just don't know why. Oh. Okay. 
There was a go. button there, but it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, so, so kicking it off, um, Anna Palma has a poster on the new user interface, uh, the ITP2 Shrine user interface that Diane just showed a slide on earlier. And um, I won't try to add any details to this description because uh, I am not particularly familiar with the poster, but this should be this should be a must see and probably will be available. It'll certainly be available in the digital collection if if anyone is an AMIA member that is not going to the conference. Um, next slide. And then we have a panel, um, an ACT panel. So we, we've been trying to have a panel somehow related to ACT at the last few AMIAs. And so this panel is going to include um, myself, Darren Henderson, Sean Viswaswaran, Hussein Astiri, and Sean Murphy. Um, it's going to cover, it's going to focus on data quality this year on different aspects of data quality. So I'm going to be talking about data harmonization and uh, data validation, um, lining up uh, terminologies and code mapping so they make sense across sites, and then looking at more complex things in the record that require chart review. Uh, Darren Henderson is going to introduce the concept of loyalty cohorts, which I'm going to briefly go over today. And then uh, Hussein Astiri is going to go deeper into that using machine learning to try to predict uh, outcomes with the loyalty cohort. And I'll touch on that in the next section of this talk as well. And then Sham is going to talk about ontologies in ACT, specifically the COVID-19 ontology and how that was developed and how that uh, enhances research. And then Sean will be giving an overall high level view of ACT. And so I think that'll be, that'll be good uh, information for us all. I think it'll also be good publicity for for the, the network and for the ITP2 platform. Uh, next slide. Uh, then um, a podium presentation Wednesday afternoon. And this, I am again involved in this one. I, I <laughs> submitted too many things for this AMIA, but, uh, but this one is about some work that I've been doing in 4CE, which is the COVID research consortium that uh, Zach Kahani convened at the beginning of the pandemic, and it's um, it's built on, say, loosely built on I2B2 and ACT. It uses ACT data uh, to create, you know, more digested data extracts for analytics uh, for COVID research. And recently, we've also onboarded some OMOP sites, so trying trying to support different platforms. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about this, this interesting concept that has been in the news a lot, actually, where uh, a lot of people are being admitted, well, less now that we're in a bit of a slump, but a lot of people are being admitted to the hospital with a COVID positive test, um, but they're not necessarily in the hospital for anything related to COVID at all. They're maybe in the hospital for a car accident or a routine uh, knee surgery or something, and they just happen to have a COVID positive test that is discovered when they get to the hospital and the COVID remains asymptomatic throughout their hospital stay. But in statistics and in research, in public health statistics and in research, they're still being counted as COVID patients, which is probably messing up our research conclusions and certainly messing up our public health reporting. So I'm going to talk about combating that through, uh, through informatics and chart review. Uh, okay, uh, next slide. And then um, Sham is presenting, I'm told this is, yeah, I updated the slide, good. I'm told this is a five minute presentation. So that will be, that will be fun for him. It's uh, just about cohort development uh, across data models. Uh, let me read a bit of this. Large scale use of EHR data has enabled the development of common data models, but common data models are not trivial to query across platform, across data models. So we describe a solution to query across CDMs. So this is this is the project wherein um, the team at Pitt primarily is putting together ontologies for ACT that support querying different underlying tables using the multi-fact component of I2B2 that Lori Phillips developed a few years ago. So there is an ACT-OMOP ontology, for example, that 
will query underlying OMOP tables uh, using all the concepts in ACT. And there's now, a, I think, an alpha version of a Picornet CDM um, ontology. We have an old version of a Picornet ontology, but this one's based on ACT and is more up to date. Uh, anyway, so that that is, I probably talked about it for five minutes just now. So we'll see how much Sean can fit into his talk, but I think that'll be a fun one. Okay, next slide. And then I um, signed up for a system demo where I'm going to be demonstrating some of our analytics around collecting patient counts, which uh, we lovingly call total nums, uh, which is just collecting the number of patients with every fact in the ontology. So, you know, 56,000 patients had type 2 diabetes and uh, 41,000 patients had a beta blocker and you just collect all these numbers across all the sites. And then you can look at the variances between sites and you know, focus a bit in this presentation on looking at mapping differences across sites. And uh, in the midst of this, we're also probably going to do a demo of the new Shrine web client it's because it's it also shows differences in mapping and it's something that a lot of people haven't seen yet. Uh, so that that is that systems demo. And I think that covers all of the um, all of the AMIA presentations. I see a question in the chat. If AMIA panel and other sessions, are they streamed live during the summit for remote participants? I'm fairly sure they are again this year. Um, you do have to be registered, I think, for AMIA for the, for the summit, but I'm pretty sure they are. I don't know if anyone if anyone can speak to that with certainty. I think some sessions are. So, some of them will be? So you said, Diane? Yeah, I think some, oh. I think some sessions are um, live streams and some aren't. Yeah. OK. Um, well. Lack of certainty there, so let's just move on to loyalty cohorts. Hey, Diane, how much more time do do I have? Probably 15, 15 or 20 more minutes. Oh, okay. I won't rush then. Okay. So there's this, this funny word on the screen, loyalty cohorts, and I'm going to talk about what that what that means to us and uh, how it could be useful. This is a project that we are endeavoring, we've been working on since like last spring actually in, um, in kind of our ACT for Research subgroup, thinking about ways that we can uh, apply ACT to um, uh, discover things that are you know, publishable in, in manuscripts. And, um, and this loyalty cohort concept is something that has been around in some form or other for many years, but we're attempting to implement something at scale and act. So next, next slide, please. So what do we mean by a loyalty score? Uh, there's this concept of EHR continuity. So if a patient is loyal, quote unquote, to a healthcare system, they get most of their care from that healthcare system. This creates EHR continuity, meaning if you look longitudinally across a, across a patient's record, you actually see all of the things that the uh, patient has gotten healthcare for. So you'll see maybe an annual PCP visit and um, annual lab tests and uh, occasional uh, hospitalization or medication or something like that. Uh, and, and so we want to study patients in our research that have high EHR continuity because otherwise you're, you get incorrect conclusions because you find a patient that is in the hospital. And there are a lot of patients in our data that go to the hospital once at at an MGB hospital, and that's that's all the data we have on them, or who have demographics in the system but never actually have a visit because maybe they got a lab drawn at MGB. So we want to not not focus on those patients because otherwise you'll draw incorrect conclusions like oh if a patient is in the hospital for severe pneumonia then they're going to be perfectly healthy afterward because they're never going to get any more care. 
um, which is not the correct conclusion because you simply don't have the data about what happens to the patient after that point. Uh, so uh, lack of continuity can cause data missingness, which can lead to incorrect conclusions. Uh, there have been a couple of a uh, couple of takes on this. Griffin Weber did some amazing work on exploring different um, loyalty co loyalty approaches uh, a few years ago. Um, and uh, the, but the one I'm highlighting here was written by uh, Josh Lynn and Sebastian Sunyweis and team. And it it is the one we decided to uh, to utilize for this particular work just because it's easy to replicate. Uh, a quantitative measure. Uh, it was called identifying patients with high data completeness to improve validity of comparative effectiveness research in electronic health records data. Basically, they, the team selected 20 variables that they thought were reflective of uh, patients that would have high EHR continuity. And uh, I'll show those on the next slide. But then they did some regression analysis and fitted it to some of their data, and they came up with coefficients for those variables. So to create, to figure out the loyalty score for a patient, you just uh, check all of these binary variables to see if they're true. Like, did the patient have a diagnosis? Did the patient have two encounters? And uh, multiply each of those factors by the coefficient and sum them, and you get a loyalty score. And the higher the loyalty score, the more loyal the patient is. Uh, we've been tending to look at the top decile of patients as being loyal, but there's no, there's no guarantee that that's the right cutoff. It, it's more of a, a continuous measure. As the loyalty score gets higher, the more likely the patients are loyal. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is also from Josh's paper, and this just shows some of the coefficients. Um, some, some of them make you know, very intuitive sense. Like if they've seen the same provider greater than or equal to three times the third line there, then they get a big bump in their coefficient in their, um, in their score because that means that they have at least been regularly seeing the same provider for a period of time. Uh, whereas if you look at um, on the right side toward the bottom, it says with one diagnosis recorded in the EHR, you actually lose some loyalty if you only have one diagnosis in the EHR because pretty much anyone with a record has a diagnosis in the EHR. Um, not everyone, but most people do because whenever you're going to bill for anything, you have to have a diagnosis code. Uh, but if you have two diagnoses in the EHR, then it's a much stronger correlation with the patient actually use it, utilizing the healthcare system with some regularity. So there's, there's that type of measure where it's, uh, do you have multiples of these common, common facts? But then, then you have some very specific ones, most of which are starred here for unrelated reasons. Um, but you, you see a PSA test, colonoscopy, pap smear, mammography, which are things that you would probably get done at your home healthcare institution. You are unlikely to go to somewhere unusual just to get your colonoscopy. Uh, and it's not going to be an emergency situation usually. So that, that is an indicator of uh, loyalty to the local healthcare, the current healthcare system. Um, you do, you might know, you might, if you're thinking about it, you might think about a particular problem with some of of these, right? Mammography, PSA test, colonoscopy, these don't usually occur in anyone under 50, certainly not anyone under 40. And, and so it's, you're going to have a bias toward an older population. And that uh, this original study was done on the Medicare population. So that, you know, that bias is, is, is okay. And we haven't, uh, to, to mitigate this in a really a rigorous way, we'd have to retrain the model, and we haven't attempted to go down that road yet. But that might be something in our eventual future. Um, also, another another trick with some of these, like mammography and uh, colonoscopy, they don't happen every year. So there's this very variation. How how far back in the record do you look when you're looking for a loyalty score? Do you look back 
three years, five years, 10 years? And that's another, another question we're exploring. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So this is uh, one site that, and this is just the distribution of loyalty score. It's a probability density graph, courtesy of uh, Hussein Asteri. It, it just shows uh, as the loyalty score increases on the x-axis, the uh, number of patients or the probability of having that loyalty score goes down quite a bit. So you have a lot of patients with a loyalty score of 0.05 or 0.15 or 0.22 or something like that. And then beyond that, you, you get a long tail. Yeah. Uh, hello? I don't think that was a question. Okay, next slide, please. You can also graph out the particular components of loyalty. This is two site, MGB and, and University of Kentucky. I, I won't tell you which is which, but this just, just shows you for most of the variables um, what percentage of total patients have these data. So this isn't among loyalty pa loyal patients. This is... Um, this is, this is among uh, all patients. And you have, you know, most patients have a, uh, I'm thinking I might've actually removed patients that, that didn't have any data, but among patients that do have data then, you have, um, you have a lot of patients with one diagnosis, but you actually have a lot of patients with two diagnoses too. And you have a lot of patients with, um, with uh, inpatient and inpatient or outpatient visit. Uh, you, you have a smaller number, but enough that you, it's probably a good marker of loyalty uh, who have a routine care visit. Uh, it's interesting. We don't have that many patients with these kind of age specific, uh, specific, specific tests. And that might, because we're not doing a long enough look back. I think this was a two-year look back. And especially during the pandemic, uh, you're not going to see a lot of people going in for their routine uh, PSA or mammography or uh, certainly not um, colonoscopy. I'm, I'm surprised that flu shot is, is so low uh, because people have, as far as I know, been getting those during, the, um, during COVID. But uh, but all to say, this this is a this is a replication of a method that was that was used for a slightly different purpose. So we're finding some holes in it, but in the end, it might not matter because all you're really looking for is a higher loyalty score for patients that utilize the healthcare system regularly, and a low, lower lower loyalty score for those who don't. And you can see some of these variables work quite well. So uh, now we're in the process of trying to look at different, um, different research and see how our research conclusions can change as we implement this loyalty score. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through these slides pretty quickly, but we're basically, we're, filter, we're taking uh, 4CE data, which is a subset of ACT data, pretty much, um, on, the, uh, on the right top and filtering it by patients who scored high in loyalty on the bottom left and creating this cohort of loyal patients in that data set with the red, the red box around it. And then uh, one project is to look at the relative risk of, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the relative risk of post-acute sequelae of COVID after having had a COVID hospitalization. So 90 days after you get hospitalized with COVID, then what's your chance, what's your relative risk of getting a diagnosis code versus, um, versus the, the whole population? Okay, next slide, please. And this graph doesn't tell you any specific thing, but it's an interesting trend to look at. The bottom row, the red, shows the relative risk for various fee codes, so various diagnosis categories, um, if you ignore the loyalty score. 
and you can see that you know actually you can't you can't because there's no y axis sorry about that but but the re relative risk increases you know above 1 for some of these uh, for some of these diagnosis codes which which would would show some potential relationship with post acute sequelae of covid but then interestingly the top is if you only take the top decile of loyalty and suddenly you get a lot more uh, variance and a lot higher relative risk. And the thought is that that's just because we're eliminating all these patients with missing data where there would be no increase in relative risk because they have no data anyway. Uh, but, but by getting patients that are actually utilizing the healthcare system, you can actually see the real relative risk. That's the hypothesis, though we haven't tested that particularly in this work yet, but we have another thing going on. Next slide, please. And this is a fairly similar um, diagram, but the thing in the middle is the eMERGE diabetes algorithm. So we're looking specifically at the risk of developing type 2 diabetes 90 days after COVID. And um, this uses a, an established and validated algorithm to detect diabetes in the electronic health record, which involves some number of diagnoses of diabetes and or diabetes medication or diabetes uh, test results. And then we're using a, uh, a framework called Mellow that, uh, that wraps up some functions in R to make it easy to do some machine learning on that. Um, next slide, please. And this is what, this is what we've seen so far. We've seen, um, so, uh, this is one site, we haven't done this at other sites yet, but we, we do see an increase in relative risk. So what you're seeing is an odds ratio on the y-axis and an increase in loyalty score, like you saw before, on the x-axis. So as the loyalty score goes up, the relative risk of type 2 diabetes appearing after COVID goes up. So we're, all, we're also seeing that trend that we saw with that relative risk of, uh, of diagnoses in general we're seeing that uh, relative risk increase as loyalty score increases. Uh, this slide's also courtesy of Hussein Asturi, who's been doing the, uh, the analytics around this type 2 diabetes question. Um, so these, these two studies are both works in progress, but, um, but it's something we hope to publish on, which will give some visibility to ACT. We've been trying to do as much as possible of this study as ACT shrine queries, which will, which will to utilize our tools and to figure out where we need to enhance them, which is a good exercise for our network. And um, we, we also are making these tools available to people. Uh, next slide, please. So you can download our loyalty cohort script uh, at uh, this GitHub address. And uh, we tend to tweak it now and again but it's uh, pretty much finished. The MS SQL version was, was written by uh, Darren Henderson at Kentucky and Michelle Morris uh, poured herself into converting it to Oracle. So we have an Oracle version and a SQL server version and no Postgres version yet, but if anyone would like to adapt it, that would be great. And um, the, the, the studies and study results are coming. We're also thinking about how we can actually integrate this into ACT. We, we have you know, some derived facts in ACT right now, and maybe we can add some more derived facts. Maybe we can add loyalty score into, um, into ACT data loads, compute this ahead of time, and then be able to use it uh, as an exploratory value when you're doing queries. So that's... That's on our mind for the future, um, but uh, we have not we have not gone that route yet. So I think I have a minute or two to take any questions before we move on to our keynote. Any questions, you can unmute yourself or put a question in the chat. Or if you think of a question later, put it in the chat. We can answer it at the end.
Okay, I think we can probably move on. So let's um, move on to our next uh, agenda. And um, Rudy Potenzone and uh, Peter Rice will jump in and give us a uh, sort of a, um, a high level basic um, overview of um, Transmart. Rudy, Peter. Thank you, Diane. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Super. So um, ITB2 was started, I don't know, around 2005, I guess. And after a couple of years, um, the scientists at J&J &J decided they wanted to have something that was a little more uh, able to handle uh, some of the data uh, more deeply than the, the just the HR data that they had. And so bringing in a lot more you know, study information on clinical trials, gene expression and the like. Uh, and that's when they started uh, Transmart um, uh, software, which they worked on for a couple of years, um, felt that it was going to become too big for them to handle as an internal project, and they pushed it out into open source. Uh, and the, uh, we, we started the Transmart Foundation to, um, to really you know, take over Transmart and, and kind of nurture it along, uh, although Transmart has been an open source and very much of a, a public developed, publicly developed um, package with a lot of contributions of functionality from the, the community. And then we as the, the foundation have worked on it to, um, you know, we do the releases, we do the manage the, the testing and things and the actual release process. Uh, and that's what um, Peter and I do. Um, we have the next version coming uh, of Transmart, which is 19.1, which hopefully is a couple of weeks away a couple months. Um, and uh, what's interesting about version 19.1 is that now we have synchronized back again the I2B2 uh, data model with Transmart. And so you can open a Transmart study in uh, I2B2 and you can open up an I2B2 database within Transmart. And we're working to make um, you know, more, more capabilities within uh, the two products to handle each other's data. And so what we'll talk about now is, is largely 19.1, but it's largely what's, what's in uh, Transmart today. Next slide. <clears throat> so the, you know, Transmart itself handles, it's, it handles a number of different types of data. And then there are a number of tools that, uh, that go uh, along with the, this data. Uh, in terms of data types, uh, as I, I mentioned, it handles clinical trial data a lot of information on the, the subjects, the, the organisms, the um, treatments, interventions, et cetera, uh, expression data, from GEO and TCGA, uh, microarray data, RNA-seq, et cetera. And then uh, on these, we can do a lot of different uh, types of analysis, um, which we'll, we'll just touch on a couple of these and give some examples, but um, just to show you, uh, generally speaking, but you know, Transmart is uh, very much of a, of a data uh, analysis uh, system and allows you to do a lot of a lot of different things um, as we move through it. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> um, we do have also a number of public data sets that we've gathered up. So these are uh, data that um, has been published and made uh, available to in the public domain. Uh, and so we've taken these, we've formatted them in Transmart format, and then we have them stored. Uh, in uh, file systems, and uh, if you're interested in the different, you know, and we have you know tables and catalogs of what these are, and so if there's uh, some particular data that you might be interested in, or you want to get an idea of what people have done in certain areas, uh, you can pop in and take a look at these uh, and uh, make use of these, uh, as well as a number of, of ontologies and data dictionaries uh, again that we, we maintain and, and are available to use um, within Transmart. Next slide. So um, as I said, the, the focus of Transmart are studies. And when you bring in a study, um, you, you can have different types of data that, that come in with it. Um, within, uh, you know, whether it's expression data or, or you know, other high dimensional data that, that comes in, uh, could be some clinical trial information, you know, references, uh, other metadata. So uh, it can handle quite a large, uh, diff uh, uh, really, um, uh, different types of data uh, that you bring into the system. In the next slide, I think talks a little bit more about some of the specifics. You know, you obviously we keep track of how many subjects are in a particular study, but then there could be different categorical types of uh, data like male, female or other types of, of specific information. 
obviously a whole bunch of numerical uh, ranges, uh, age and, and other types of things. And then the different um, you know, omics uh, types of information in terms of expression uh, and uh, uh, RNA-seq data and the like. And so that, you know, that um, just you know, is, is really quick, you know, that gives you an idea of sort of the types of information that you can load with the system. Uh, and I think the best now, I think I'm going to turn it over to Peter, who's going to talk a little bit about the specifics of some of the types of things that you can do. Next slide. And Peter, are you there? Okay, thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so this shows you the, the way that the, uh, the concept tree looks in, uh, in Transmark. So we've opened up a study here. Um, we see some biomarker data at the top, which is, uh, in this case, gene expression data by microarray. And it's got a little uh, DNA icon to show uh, its uh, gene expression data. We've got some numerical data here for metastasis free survival. And you could select by range of months when you're selecting that. And we have some, some categorical values, some basic text data. You can select any of the text values uh, for cell type in this case when you're going through and looking at the data. Um, the uh, Everything in Transmart is stored below a study level. So each study has its own tree. And uh, when you pick up one of the publicly curated studies, you can't quite be sure where to find things. So you may find subjects and demographics, or you may find some other place to store the age, gender, and other information. Similarly, lab results, diagnoses could be in different places. Uh, in Transmart, because the study tends to be for a particular disease, you just find one diagnosis, and it may be just in the title. In this case, the UV or melanoma, everyone in the study often has it, or there may be some control cases for the expression. Okay, next slide. So the, the main workhorse in Transmart is to go into the, the, uh, the Analyze tab, and the first thing you see is the Comparison tab. So you can take any of the terms from the, the tree, which you see um, not expanded yet on the left. Um, we have a set, of, uh, a set of various studies, so local clinical trials. IMI is a European uh, Innovative Medicines Initiative. Uh, in two series of that, which is public and private partnerships looking at data. Um, some private studies where you can control the access to them, public studies, like the, the hundreds that Rudy mentioned, and some test studies that we use for testing transport functionality. You can take any of the concepts there and drag them across into the first subset and you'll build a cohort to do further analysis. Or you can create two subsets and run comparisons, depending on your, your aims. And pretty much you can drag anything across. If you drag a numerical value, you'll be prompted for the range of values you want. If you drag categorical data, you can drag the individual categories or you can drag them all and have everyone that's got um, tumor subtype defined or something like that. Okay, and you can save the subsets for reuse. So you basically save the queries that are generated. Next slide. So having uh, got your subsets, you can then take a look at them in more detail. So we have two views. There's a summary statistics view that shows some standard data, age, sex, race, um, always up here. And then any other notes that you've included in your subset query. So any other important data that you were using from, from that study. And then once you've got that, you can drag in other nodes and see how they look as well. Um, basically see what values you get in each of the subsets. Then there's a grid view where you see a tabular version of the data. And you can see all of the, the subjects, um, age, sex, race information, um, and any other um, terms from the ontology that you've dragged across and used in the query. And you can drag more in and, and look at those, and you can adjust the view. Uh, I've got some examples coming up. Next slide. So summary statistics, this is a bit of a dull one because they're all female. You, you see the breakdown of male and female. You see the uh, breakdown by race. Um, you see um, oh, yeah, age histogram for all patients if the data is, is available uh, for that study. And in this case, we've uh, it's a 
you know, a SAR study, we've got some information about the treatments and those have been dragged in and used in the uh, building the subset. Okay, next, oh, and you can, yeah, you can drag in any other terms that, that you like. The second one we've uh, dragged in um, from the high dimensional data, from gene expression data, we've dragged in um, the expression data and selected one particular gene. Uh, so this is, it's flagged as lung, that's just the title given to the node, and we know the gene. And then we've got um, two subsets. Um, we don't, at the top of the page, you see a, a query that tells you which subset we're using. Uh, but you see that the expression of this particular gene is um, much lower in subset one than it is in subset two. And so on the left, you have a, a um, histogram showing you the, the log intensities of gene expression for the two subsets, one in yellow and one in blue. And on the right, you have a box plot showing you uh, the mean values and the spread. So actually no overlap in those box plots, that's pretty clear. And then you can drag in other genes and see how they look and just explore your data within the, the summary statistics and maybe go back and uh, change the queries. So it's, it's a data exploration tool and very easy to, to have a look and see what's uh, what your data can give you. Uh, next slide should be the grid view, I think. Yeah. So here you have um, the patient codes from the, the study, uh, whether they're in subset one or two, the name of the, the study, GSE 8581 in this case is one of the studies in the gene expression omnibus. Um, we um, also report sex, age, race, and whether they're male or female, and then any other data that you've uh, brought in. And then you can go um, and click on a little arrow above each of these and sort the columns. So you can sort by subset one and subset two, or you can sort by um, sex. You can sort by any of the other categorical values you've dropped in. Um, you can hide columns, so we could hide the age, race, and the male columns in this case because they're, they're empty and have a bit more space to view the rest. Um, okay, next slide. So once you've chosen your, uh, your subset to analyze or your two subsets to compare, there are then a set of um, workflows that you can launch to run analyses. And there are two ways to do those. The first one is the is a, a batch analysis. You just launch the analysis and the results will appear. Um, they're all driven by R scripts underneath. The results come up as um, images or as um, sometimes as tables. So we have analysis for uh, array um, CGH, um, box plots, correlation plots. Um, we have a set of heat maps. You can have them clustered in various ways and uh, one of them also picks out marker selection and gives you a table of results. There's a dose response curve, line graphs, logistic reg regression, uh, principal component analysis, scatter plots and uh, yeah quite a, quite a range. Um, we haven't added any for a while and we're planning um, after Transplant 91 to revisit these and look at adding new analyses. Um, now that we've integrated with the ITP2 data model, we are looking to have a lot more time-based analysis methods. And so uh, we will be revisit revisiting the analysis. If anyone has ideas of analyses they'd like to have, then uh, let us know. And I'll come on in a moment to how you can run your own analyses and uh, maybe derive suggestions that way as well. Next slide. So this is an example of, of one of the heat maps with uh, clustering, and you can see the clusters on the uh, hierarchical clusters on the sides. So you see the, the genes and you see the, uh, the samples that were, were used. And you can save the results from this and analyze them. There's a, an export of the results that you can use to, to look. And next slide. So the other way to do this is to, to run Smart R, which is an interactive version of the analyses. And the most used analysis methods have been ported into Smart R. So now it's an interactive interface. You can select from menus, choose what you want to run against, 
it will run the analysis. But the nice thing in Smart R is you can then go back and change some of the criteria, the genes you select or some other values and automatically run again rather than going back round and clicking launch. It will just update. Also, the, uh, the outputs are marked up so you can mouse over and get extra information from the results in Smart R. It doesn't cover everything, but there are prototype methods that were developed for the eTrix project in Europe. And we'll look at uh, and adding those, testing and adding them if they seem to come up to scratch. So there should be some examples. Next slide. OK, so here's a box plot. And you see on the right that if you mouse over, you see the values for everything on the box plot. And you can mouse over and see, I think, values for the, the dots on here as well. So we're looking at four genes in, uh, in one subset in this case. And you can choose at the top to use the raw values or the, the log intensities. And uh, you click on a button there, and it will update the plot automatically. Similarly, with the, the heat map, you can choose whether you want to cluster it, and it redoes it with the clustering and just redisplays. Whereas in the advanced workflows, that's four different options you'd run. Uh, next slide. So this is how you can do your own analysis. Uh, you can run um, the same data export that would be used for launching the, analysis, the advanced workflows. Um, you can save the results of that. It's tab delimited files and export those either um, through your browser into your local system or copy them from the server or reuse them on the server if you go on to the if you have access to the server locally to run. So you can get these tab delimited files. That's the export from, from the data you were looking at, and then run your own methods to analyze it. You have the data divided by the subsets that you've selected. You can compare them or run on one subset. And if you have an analysis that you want to use repeatedly, we can help with uh, how to put that in as a new advanced workflow need to just define the interface and define the analysis and uh, should be able to launch it and, uh, and run it and get results. OK, next slide. So we're working on uh, Transport 19.1. It's, uh, it's currently in test and we're looking to get a beta release out soon. The aim is to release Transport 19.1 um, in sync with ITV21713. The, the big thing in 19.1 is that we fully updated the data model. So you can install Transmart 19.1. It's an ITV2 database that's got everything ITV2 needs, plus the extra tables that Transmart needs for gene expression, uh, proteomics, and the other high dimensional data types, and some other um, tables for Transmart features. Uh, so we went through very carefully and we've, we've managed to load ITB2 data and use it in ITB2, but on a Transmart database. And that uh, was demonstrated at Amia last year. Uh, we've made improvements to the data loading, so it's faster, especially clinical data. Some large clinical data sets run quite slowly. And uh, with the Dell project in the last, last two years, we've found a number of improvements there, uh, particularly comparing how ITB2 does things. We've made it cleaner. So um, we have a script that just gives you a simple summary of how well it worked, rather than the usual four pages of uh, output that the ETL scripts give you. And we've made it simpler. So it is also possible to run one script that will just look for all the data and load everything you need for a study in one go and give you a little summary of what worked. Um, we've extended um, the study metadata. so. Um, showed you a brief glimpse of the study metadata in the Browse tab. We've added more fields. So internally in Transmart, there are a number of fields that um, weren't being fully used, but looked useful. So we've updated those. There are some dates for the studies. Uh, so you can check um, studies for particular dates and date the most recent ones. We're building Docker containers for the database and the web interface and the R server and a couple of others that are needed for support. Um, and once the beta release goes out, we'll provide Docker containers for the beta release. 
We support Postgres 14, that's where we're mostly testing. Transmart should work down to Postgres 9.5, 9.6 was the, um, the one we were supporting for the early versions of, uh, of Transmart. Um, and it should work on any of those, but Postgres itself has had a number of performance improvements. And in, in looking through data loading and data analysis, it seems to run much faster on 14 than on the earlier ones. We'll try to um, run some tests of Transmart 19.1 and 19.0 on uh, both Postgres versions and see how well they work. And see if we can document just how much speed up we get. We've updated all the libraries and drivers. So we've got the latest Postgres and Oracle drivers in there. Um, we've updated beyond the log4j um, issue that hit everybody over Christmas. And so we'll, keep the, we'll aim to keep all the libraries and drivers fully updated all the way through. The install scripts were um, done just for um, one specific system originally, um, but we're looking to generalize that and write install scripts for most of the common operating systems. So if you have a clean, empty system, you'll be able to run one script and it should configure everything and install Transmart for you. Alternatively, you could use the Docker containers and, and run it from there. And we're looking at making those uh, as safe and secure and easy to use as we can. And probably a mix and match approach works. Um, you might, for example, want to run your own database so you can safely archive it and save everything, but maybe run a Docker instance for some of the other things that are hard to install. Um, a Docker version of our serve is handy because it takes a while to install. And if you just drop Docker on, you've got it straight away. OK. That's OK, thanks. Was the last Peter, slide? I, think, I think that's it. Yep. Uh, so there's only a couple of minutes left, I know, but we have to answer any questions. Can you put them in the chat? window or just unmute yourself and ask. Kavi? So yeah, one quick question, um, Peter. So uh, Transmart was created as a fork of I2B2. Was that how it was developed before? It, it kind of grew out of I2B2 um, and it was worked on by J&J &J and the Combinant and then it um, was made open source. So it wasn't I2B2 code in there. Okay. Um, there was originally some ITB2 libraries in there, but they were not open source. And so as soon as it was released as GPL, they were thrown out. And uh, we can now yeah, work together again because everything's open source again. Thanks. OK, it's back to you, Diane. Right. So if there's no other questions, um, we're at the, the top of the hour anyway. Um, I hope everybody has a great day. Uh, this session is recorded and will be available on our website um, within the next few days. Um, and I hope um, maybe I'll see some of you in, in AMIA next week. Otherwise, I will um, talk to you and see you all next uh, month. Have a great day.